We're going to uh, begin with a song today, as we often do, and uh, praise my soul, the King of Heaven. So I'll, I'll encourage us to stand as we sing, and uh, we'll sing the song straight through. <laughs> spend some time in prayer in just a moment or two but before we pray together um, we'll use another song the words again will appear on the screen there it's uh, another good time to to thank God to thank him for the answer prayer the, the answer prayer that we're able to do this now we're back, we're able to meet together once again. And after we've sung these three verses through, I've asked Mike if he will come and lead us in prayer this morning. So we'll sing this song through and then Mike will lead us in prayer. <laughs>
Holy Spirit, be with us as we meet together for this morning's meeting. After some 71 weeks, we are now able to thank you with our hearts, our hands and our voices. It has been difficult for everyone over these 15 months, but at last we are allowed to sing your praises, Lord. It seems strange, Lord, that some of our normal acts of worship had to be curtailed. Hopefully we can now gradually start to regain some of our usual Sunday morning activities. Spirit of God, uplift those who will lead our worship today. Guide all who seek to inspire us through music and words. Living God, move among the congregation today, generating praise and repentance. Renew our commitment through the fellowship of the Spirit and equip us to be your people in the world, acting in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now I'm going to ask Sean if he will come and bring to us our Bible reading, which today is taken from the second book of Chronicles, chapter 7, verses 11 to 22. The Lord appeared to Solomon. When Solomon had finished the temple of the Lord and the royal palace and had succeeded in carrying out all he had in mind to do in the temple of the Lord and his own palace, the Lord appeared to him at night and said, I heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a temple for sacrifices. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or command locusts to devour the land, or send a plague among my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal the land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. I have chosen and consecrated this temple so that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will always be there. As for you, if you walk before me faithfully as David, your father did, and do all I command and observe my decrees and laws, I will establish your royal throne as a covenanted with David, your father, when I said, you shall never fail to have a successor to rule over Israel. But if you turn away and forsake the decrees and commands I have given you and go off to serve all the gods and worship them, then I will uproot Israel from my land, which I have given them, and I will reject this temple which I have consecrated for my name. I will make it a byword and an object of ridicule among all people. This temple will become a heap of rubble. All who pass by will be appalled and say, Why has the Lord done such a thing to this land and to this temple? People will answer, Because they have forsaken the Lord the God of their ancestors, who brought them out of Egypt and have embraced all the gods, worshipping and saving them. That is why he brought all this disaster on them. Now, I won't go all the way back there, Jean. At this point, we're going to listen to the message from the band.
So I guess for many of us it is an exciting day today. It's a, a day that we can feel like, at last, we can finally, properly be back in this church business. Now I've been trying to work out where to go with the, the preaching over recent weeks. Or over the next few weeks, should I say. And um, most of the ideas I came up with just didn't seem right. Until. And I, I don't even know that it came up in the conversation. But whilst there was a conversation going on Tuesday night at band practice, it clicked, it clicked into place. Now... Those of you who may have seen or may have heard me saying that our territorial commander has encouraged us as the Salvation Army not to think about this kind of event of us going back, but that we're deciding to move forward. And I believe that is quite right. But while we work out what that means, it occurs to me that, yes, we should be moving forwards, but there are some things we need to make sure we deal with. And most of the things that I could think of all seem to start with the same two letters, R-E, to re-something. We need to return to God, to his word, to prayer and to fellowship. We need to recover. We need to regroup, to revive, to rescue and actually even to relax. And you may argue that over the last 17 months or however long it's been that we've done nothing but relax. But I think there's a holy way of doing that. Then I remembered this well-known and well-used verse in Second Chronicles. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, turn from their wicked ways and I will hear them from heaven and will come and heal their land. But like many well-known Bible verses, we need to look around and look for the whole context. There are some of those words that we skip over quite likely because they're only small words, but they're very powerful. Words like when or if and then. Small, seemingly insignificant words that can change a whole lot of this stuff if we forget about them. But there's also a reminder that we are God's people and that we carry his name. And these are all things to remember when we look at the deal that God is offering to Solomon. And I believe he's offering that same thing to us today. So as I say, it's easy to glance over and skip over the smaller apparently less important, but particularly powerful words that we use. And it's certainly the case with when. We can easily treat the Bible's use of the word when like um, safety announcements on an airplane. Uh, I don't know if any of you have not yet had the joys of flying somewhere, but you'll maybe have seen or heard the, the announcements that usually come over, the safety announcements. And we sometimes treat the when like those. And the Bible often uses the word when when it's talking about facing difficulty or disaster. When and not if. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command the locusts to devour the land or send a plague among my people. We are going to face trials. We have, have we not faced a plague among the people? Isn't that what we've just been going through and maybe what we're still going through to some degree? Now, once we accept that it's inevitable, that it's when we can move on to if. As I say, when we're treating it like a safety announcement, it's a bit like, you know, in the unlikely event of a loss of cabin pressure, that's not what God is saying here. 
He's not saying in the unlikely event. He's saying it's going to happen. And when it happens, he says, if, if my people who are called by my name. There's the condition to the deal. It's then that we can look for our part in our recovery and our restoration. It's also worth noting to whom this is addressed. If my people, God's people, you and me, if we've chosen to follow Jesus, are God's people who are called by my name. And how much more applicable is that to us as Christians as it was to the people of Israel back then? We literally carry his name. We call ourselves Christians. Christ is in there. We are carrying the name of God's only son. We need to remember that before any other allegiance, before any other identity, before any other label, we are God's. We are his people. It's like Paul wrote to the church at Corinth. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. We accepted that ownership when we chose to follow Jesus, to be his disciples. And let's be honest, we get a great deal from that relationship. It was true then for the people of Israel, having been delivered from slavery as well. And it's even more true for us now here as Christians. Especially when we see that we are called by his name. Being Christians, we have his name, the name of Christ. Now, understanding first that we are God's people and that we bear his name, we can look at what this deal from God is about. And he says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. This is the deal then. This is our part of the bargain. To humble ourselves. To recognise that we are only where we are. And we only have whatever we have because of God. Not because of how great we are and how fancy and lovely we are. Because God is good and gracious. And that he alone deserves our worship and our praise that we pray in season and out of season, when it's easy and when it's tough, when it's convenient and when it's inconvenient. When we know that we need something from God, but also when we just need to thank God for the great things he's already given us. And we seek his face. Now, first we have had to have humbled ourselves to even own up to the fact that we need to seek his face, that we need his guidance. And then we choose to seek his guidance over anything we do and with God in mind for everything that we do. And we turn from our wicked ways with that humility and by prayer. We seek God's thoughts about our actions. We repent. We turn back. We get on the right path once again. That's our part. But God's part of the bargain is that he will and he always does hear us from heaven. Now, however far that might feel from us at any given time, God says he will hear us from heaven. We will never be alone. He will and he does forgive our sin. And we probably need to keep reminding ourselves of that. Because I think we fall into too easily done traps of either assuming that our sin isn't that big a deal and yeah maybe it's just like a small sin maybe it's yeah okay it might be growing a bit more than we expected it to or we believe in the opposite extreme that our sin is the end of us and that we don't deserve anything because we're such awful people but he will come and he will forgive our sins And then he will bring healing. He will heal the land. That's not necessarily going to erase the past. 
It's not necessarily going to remove the memory of the pain that we feel. But God will restore us. He will reinvigorate us. He will reorientate us onto the right path once again. All of this is offered freely from God's great love, even his passion for us, his people. Now, as I said earlier, this verse 14 is often quoted and love. But we need to remember that sometimes it's the small and yet powerful words in this whole passage. Because when you read on, you'll find that it isn't just about well, if you do these things, then life will be great. But if you don't, eh, you'll just carry on as it was. That's not what it says. Because later on, there's an other if. As a matter of fact, it's a but if. In verse 19, it says, But if you turn away and forsake the decrees and commands I have given you and go off to serve other gods and worship them, then I will uproot Israel from my land, which I have given them, and I will reject this temple I have consecrated for my name. I will make it a byword and an object of ridicule among all peoples. This temple will become a heap of rubble. All who pass by will be appalled and say, Why has the Lord done such a thing to this land and to this people? And people will answer, Because they have forsaken the Lord. There isn't a middle ground here. There isn't a fence to sit on. It isn't a case of doing the same neg negligent living and getting the same rather unsatisfactory results. We need to return to God. We need to repent. We need to remove us or we remove ourselves from his protection. And then we'll become a byword for failure and for rejection of God. We have that choice right now, today. We can commit to humility before God and before one another, recognising God as the only valid way to move forward. We can recommit ourselves to deep, earnest, unceasing prayer. And we can determine to seek God's face to seek his will in all that we do as a church and as individuals by studying his word and by prayer and to re return to the basis of our faith, our relationship with the living God and to the basics of our faith of prayer and study of the word. I would suggest that's the best thing to do because I don't want us to become a byword. I don't want me to become a byword for rejecting God. And actually, I quite like the idea of accepting the deal that God gave to Solomon there in humility and prayer and seeking him to have his healing and his forgiveness and his renewal in my life. You may want to think about what your response to that is. Heavenly Father, make that a reality in each of our lives today. That we will continue and continuously choose your way to come to you in humility and to seek your face. Lord, we need you. And it feels like we need you now more than we ever have done before. So we rest in your promise that you're going to be good to your side of the bargain as we come before you in humility and prayer and repentance. Deliver for us, O oh Lord. Pray that in the name of Jesus. Amen. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each of us as we go on into the rest of our week. Amen.